Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 155, Ranking Hollywood Studios and Epcot Rides. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my informed and astute co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing okay. How about you? I'm doing okay, too. And joining us again this week from our Insights into Entertainment podcast to lend her expertise in all things Disney... I give you the illustrious Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. (laughs) (laughs) How are you doing today, dear? I'm doing okay, thank you. I'm glad to hear that. So last week we had talked about uh, analysis on popular rides from Magic Kingdom in Disney World. This week we're going to take a deep dive into popular rides at both Hollywood Studios and Epcot, many of which I can't comment on because I don't go on them. But first, before we do that, I'd like to invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can find audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Teens. You can find video and audio versions of all the network's podcasts listed as Insights into Things. And we're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, any place you can get a podcast listing these days. I would also invite you to offer your feedback. You can write into us uh, at comments and insights into things.com. You can hit us on Twitter at twitter.com slash insights underscore things, or you can get links to all of our social media on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Shall we start? We shall. Here we go. So we're going to start out first with that infinitely long walk between ride theme park of Epcot. And World Celebration is the first one that we encounter when we walk in the park. And our first ride is Spaceship Earth. Michelle, why don't you give us your thoughts on that? Mm, I'll give it an eight if we're going back to our... Our same one to ten system? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. I'll go eight. All right, that's pretty high. Thanks. What's what's the draw? Mm, I think it, it's a nice overall history of communications. Um, I think, you know, they've done justice to it to update it throughout the years. I do kind of miss what they had done in when it first opened where at the end they had kind of a futuristic like hey here's our predictions of where we're going to be because most of what they predicted is is already current right now so they were Um, accurate yeah pretty much okay um so they really haven't gone beyond to you know like they have a cute little video that you interact with at the end so you know so that kind of you know if they had kind of kept that aspect but with the end of the ride i would have given it higher so that's where i kind of okay gave fair it enough. less points so so i'll give it a six myself uh it's one of the few roller coasters in disney world and it is classified as a roller coaster okay because of the, of the technology that it's built on. i learned that from our bus driver the one day hmm uh, I give it a six. I like the historical aspect of it. And let's face it, there's not too many instances where you get to thank the Phoenicians, right? I mean, yeah. Exactly. Right? So that I like that. Uh, I like the fact that you come all the way up to modern times there. Uh, and I think it's a really efficient use of space, to be honest with you. I just, mm-hmm. I like the engineering behind the whole thing. Madison, what do you think? I'll give it an 8.5. Okay. Um, I feel 
it's a very nostalgic ride, even though I don't really think I was around um, at the time when it was at the end when they predicted everything. You um, weren't. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I figured as much. So I guess I don't dock it down because I'm not docking it down because of that. Well, it's certainly not a thrilling ride. Again, I don't really base rides off if they're thrilling over just the general experience I get. And really, the aesthetic of it's really cool. I like seeing the various eras of history. It's a great history lesson. It's nice how... I find it very timeless in a way, even though it like tries to predict the modern future and whatnot. But... um I really do like that it's kind of timeless, really just exploring the history of communication. And I really like how it's presented. It's really a nice, cool ride that you can kind of just go to and just relax for a bit. It normally doesn't have all that long of a wait, so it's really just one of those rides that you kind of chill on. But it is one of the rides that I would still go on, even if, like... It's definitely one of the ones I always want to go on when I'm at Epcot. So. Okay. I think that's uh, that's certainly fair. Next up is Journey into Imagination with Figment. Now, I usually get a headache if I'm on this ride. I just, I don't know why. Is it the music? Is it the the colors? I don't know. I give this one a four, and I know you guys are going to give it much higher than that. But I, I just have a very difficult time with this ride, especially when you get to the upside down part. Um, so I'm not a big fan of it. What I do like about it is I like the fact that they have all the activities after you get off the ride. It's a great place. It's a, like a, almost a technology demonstrator. Mm -hmm. um, it gives the kids an air-conditioned place and the parents an air-conditioned place to kind of cool off, have something to do, and then move on your day there. So it's it ends in a gift shop, but the gift shop has a lot of stuff for the kids to do. Uh, Madison, what do you think about it? Uh, I'll give it a seven. Okay. Um, I definitely know that the ride itself went through various redos. Originally, it was supposed to be a very ambitious ride, and it was supposed, to, and it's very different from when it started than when it is now. I also know that it ended up turning, like they ended up changing it, and it became really boring to the point that nobody liked it, and then they had to change it again to make it a little bit little more fun. Um, while I personally don't have necessarily nostalgia for it because I don't know the original intentions for the ride. I do enjoy the ride. It's definitely fun. The song isn't the most annoying one in uh, the park. No, that it's not the most, but it's close. It's like, I do kind of like the different verses of it. I do like that it does play with our senses, which is uh, kind of cool. The ending, while it certainly would give you a headache, is... It's definitely very extensive, and I kind of like that aesthetic. Um, and again, the ending uh, when you actually get to have the activities in the what if lab, what if labs, I'm pretty sure they call it, which right. I'm pretty sure is where most of Pixar's uh, uh, stories go from. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I really do like the ending of it. Um, and I'm really only docking it down because it's not really a. It has a nice aesthetic to it, but it's not the most entertaining ride okay. to me. Michelle, what are your thoughts? Well, I will give it a seven as well um, because it, it went through the iterations where, you know, the, it was very much a figment ride at one point in time. Uh, then they got rid of figment and that's when nobody went <laughs> on the ride at all and then they realized you know what we have this character we really should bring him back and they they brought him back so i think uh you know for that aspect of it um i enjoy the fact too and again if you're not somebody that went to disney you know way back in the day um all of the upside down stuff is actually recycled from one of the original uh other epcot rides horizons where there was a scene where you know you're they're showing everything and you know people live upside down because zero gravity I think. and this is why we have 
Michelle right, this on is because why she's the I'm history here. buff. Yep. So when you know, so for people that saw that, it was like, oh my god, they're you know, so they you know, so it's nice to see Disney recycles things and and changes it up and everything, and you know they brought the song back, and so it's it kind of still still there. Um, you know, it would be nice if Dreamfinder was was part of it a little bit more because he was part of the original ride, but you kind of have. A little homage to him, you know, at the end. Um, the other thing, too, is, yes, you you have the little play area. The other thing, too, was that was also where Honey, I Shrunk, the audience, used to play also in that same pavilion because they had the movie theater there, too. That was where originally uh, Michael Jackson's Captain Nemo played, uh, Captain EO uh, played, and then the Honey, I Shrunk, the audience, which was like an interactive... 4d 3d movie type thing they had you know and and the seats actually kind of shook at some point um so unfortunately when the movie left that's when they had changed uh um figment so like nobody was going to that pavilion at all so at least when they they changed it up then more people started going again so so that does it for World Celebration. We'll now talk about World Discovery, where we have Mission Space, which none of us have ever gone on. So we'll skip Mission Space <laughs> yeah, for a discussion. Unfortunately, yeah. And then Next. we'll go on to what's probably, I think, our family's most favorite ride there, which I've never been on, and that's Test Track. So, Maddie, why don't you tell us about Test Track and how you'd rate it? Uh, Test Track is definitely an interesting ride. Basically, if you go with the regular queue, which most of the time is really long, you get to create your own car, and the whole point of the ride is that you test it in various scenarios to see how it holds up against everybody you're riding with. Because we do the single ride most of the time, we don't actually have a car, um, but the single ride, it goes way faster than the regulars, so, you know. The line does, not the car. The line, right. yeah. Um, and I'm going to give it a 10. Um, okay. It's definitely, again, you said it's basically our favorite ride, um, in the park and for good reason. It's the closest thing to a roller coaster you're going to go on there in a way. Um, I don't even know if it's really classified as a roller coaster. I don't think it is. It but is no, but it yeah. is the fastest ride in, in Disney World. In Disney, in Disney World. World. So, so heh, I go on the fastest ride in Disney World. There you but, go. And probably the slowest ones, too. <laughs> yeah, um, so I'll give it a 10 because it's really a fun ride. It's really not like anything else you like. And probably the best part is the final test where you're outside and you go as fast as possible. And it's really one of the funnest times ever. Um, You'll hit as, as fast as 59 miles an hour. I thought 64. That's what it's supposed to be, but the bus driver said it was 59. Oh, did he? Mm. Okay. Um, but yeah, still really fast. And again, the fastest ride in Disney World. So, you know. 10 because it's really fun and I like the concept. All right. Michelle, your thoughts? I will give this one a 10 as well. Um, <laughs> so here's my funny story that I kind of hinted at um, last week was it took me three years to actually get on to the ride. Um, I am the type of person that I need to see the ride. I need to see what it does to go on it. So I won't just go on a ride without seeing, except I did with um, Rise of the Resistance. <laughs> well, you've regretted that. And yeah. I did regret that, not knowing. I, I didn't read the spoilers. Yeah. Um, so back then, there weren't really spoilers for, you know, the rides. And there probably were, but I didn't know. And I, I wouldn't go on it. So every, you know, time that I went to Disney, you know, had the opportunity to go on it, wouldn't go on it. So one year we had an opportunity. I went with a friend of mine who happened to work for AT&T at the time. And AT&T at that time was sponsoring Spaceship Earth. And if you were an employee, you had to show your badge and you could get into their lounge area. So we were in the lounge for Spaceship Earth and we were talking about Test Track. And they were my friend, my, my friend and um, the other person that we were with uh, said, 
oh, well, she's never been on it. She won't go on it. Da, da, da. And they gave us a pass to go to the GM lounge because GM at the time was sponsoring uh, Test Track. So we go to Test Track. And when you go to Test Track's lounge, you're actually on top and you can actually look down and see the whole ride. So after many drinks of Coca-Cola because they didn't have alcohol in their lounge, I decided, okay, I'm going to go on this ride. And the idea behind it at the time, and even still now, is that you are testing out a car. So you're on... So you're a crash test dummy. You're kind of a crash crash test dummy. So they do, you know, uh, regular brakes and... um, um, Emergency brake. Emergency brake. And, you know, so they do that. And then going through hot temperatures and cold temperatures. And then these hairpin turns. And then finally... The speed test is is the final thing. So I get on it, and as we're nearing the end, going around these hairpin turns, it stops. So now I'm freaking out because the ride breaks down while I'm I'm on it. And it was maybe only three minutes that we were down, and then it started back up and everything was fine. So of course, you know, oh my god, I'm never going on this again! And that's the one ride that we will do multiple times, uh, you know, at, at Disney together, so. Okay, well, I'm glad it worked out for you. Uh, so moving on the world of nature, we have Living with the Land, that theft-defying, incredibly <laughs> exciting ride. <laughs> That boat ride through the wilderness. Uh, Madison, why don't you tell us about about Living with the Land? Living with the Land is basically um, supposed to be... It's like an actual area where plants are grown in Epcot. Um, they And they turned it kind of into a ride. Um, I know from what... Because why not? It's Disney, right? I know from what you've told me, there were actually used to be people there, like, talking about the plants, and you could actually ask questions. Right. There actually used to be a tour guide on the actual boat that you went through and would tell you about the different things. So Disney made a ride out of watching grass grow. (laughs) That's incredible. Basically. And you could actually do a behind-the-seeds tour and do a walking tour of the area. Um... I will say it reminds me a lot of uh, the Chocolate World um, ride where they talk about like how they make chocolate, but in this case it's an actual real area where they grow plants and like they actually tried to make it into a ride. Um, I'll probably give it a five. Like It's a good educational ride, but it's really boring. <laughs> And well, there's that, not a lot. That's a stunning endorsement. <laughs> I mean, come on. What what do you have to say about it then? Well, I, I would give it a four. Um, it it's not even fully air conditioned, which you know that's that's pretty high among my my rating points on on rides. But it's a boat ride, and you go through the different habitats, and you see the different ways that they grow things. Um, what's interesting about it is they harvest what they grow there, and they sell it at the restaurants there. So a good portion of the food that you eat from a, a vegetable and you know non dairy non meat standpoint, a lot of it comes from what they grow there. So that's kind of cool because not it's not just the areas that you see there. They've got large greenhouses and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of cool where you can. It's almost like going to Red Lobster and picking your lobster out of the tank type thing. You know, <laughs> hey, I want that cucumber over there. You know. Uh, but that's neat. It's neat seeing the different technologies. But you're you're right. It's educational. It's not particularly exciting. There's no drops. There's nothing thrilling to it. It's a nice slow ride. Michelle, what do you think about it? Yeah, I would give it a five. It's you know, it's really that educational thing. You know, trying to show you the different environments and and how to you know, harvest things. So, you know, in, in a desert environment, here's how you can grow things. And, you know, here's a simulation of something in space. They even do, um, fish as well. Um, you know, and showing you how, how they do that. So not just fruits and vegetables, but even fish. Um, you know, so it's kind of interesting to, to see that again, most people, when they're going to an amusement park or a theme park, they're looking for something big and exciting. And this is part of that whole educational 
aspect that Epcot's really kind of known for. Well, and if you're a prepper or a survivalist, <laughs> right. it's a great lesson on how to actually, you know, build, you know, your vertical growing beds mm -hmm. and your hydroponics and all right. that stuff mm -hmm. so that in, during the zombie apocalypse, you know how to survive. There you thank go. you. Thank you, Disney, for equipping us during the zombie apocalypse. Uh, that brings us to probably the second favorite ride that we have in that park, and that's Soarin' Around the World. It used to be Soarin' Over California. It's Soarin' Around the World now. Mm -hmm. Maddie, why don't you tell us about that? Soarin' Around the World is basically your put in this hang hanging hang glider basically <laughs> you put in this hang glider and uh pretty much you're going to take a tour around the world and you're actually lifted up off the ground and there's a big cinema screen and like you're it's basically simulating you going around the world when you're not actually going around the world so it's basically a movie but like you're up high and you're experiencing it and you get like little turns and whatnot so how do you rate it uh, I'll give it a nine. It's definitely a very unique ride, um, and it's, it's really fun. I do like the theming of it, like, I like how they call us, like, aviators, and, like, I do like the whole idea of, oh, this is your flight. It's a really, it's really fun concept. While the movie can certainly get, while the movie's pretty much the same most of the time, um, when you watch it, uh, I really do like the idea of being lifted off in a hang glider and i think that's a really cool part to it even though i'm like afraid of heights i can actually handle that yeah and i think i'd probably give that a nine too it's depending on where you wind up because there's three rows that you can wind up in and as it comes up it the front row comes all the way up to the top and it's a three-story building that you're in yeah. and there's no floor and if you're on the end of the row, you're literally dangling, dangling 30 feet in the air there. Um, and the screen itself is sort of like an IMAX screen where it's a dome that it projects it in. So it's a very immersive feel to it. And it's motion controlled. So this thing is moving back and forth and swinging as you're flying and stuff like that. And there are times that you don't feel secure because it's only a lap belt that you have on. And there's literally nothing to hold on to. Yeah, and like the only time, and like for kids, there's like this one bar that's like in between your legs that you can strap on, which makes you feel a little safer. And it's like maybe you do it for the adults as well. Right, right, and you know, the, you you if you're in the middle, you see people hanging above you, and their leg, your legs are just dangling out there. So it's it's a real feeling the way that they do it, uh, and they blow air at you as you're flying around. Um, there's certain scents. There's certain scents that they'll do, so it gives you that that real feeling of it. So it's 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 pretty cool. The problem I have is it's always such a long wait to get on the thing. Yeah. And like the ride's over before you blink. So it's it, it's one of those ones where it's hard to justify the wait. Michelle, I would give it a nine as well. It's very reminiscent, and I don't know if other amusement parks in the world you know, had anything like this, but growing up and going to Great Adventure, they used to have a movie and it was basically this dome theater, but you stood and everybody kind of stood and they would do, you know, like these action shots where you were on the rapids and you, you know, so it was like almost like the same kind of thing, but you stood there and you would find yourself swaying and moving, even though there was nothing in the theater that right. moved. It was just the sensation of it because it wasn't a 3D movie. Just the movie. optical illusion. Right, just the optical, you know. And I used to love going to that. So when Soaring opened, it was kind of that to the next level because, again, it's that domed feeling, but because you're kind of, you know, now you're on this hang, you know, the, this, this glider swaying, going back and forth, it helps to, you know, in intensify um, it as well. And then, you know, if you look at the history of how they created the ride, it was really kind of an interesting, uh, you know, backstory where, you know, the, the Imagineer got his little connects set and just kind of, you know, made a little toy prototype of yeah, it. Pull, it was like, pull the stinker toy out of the, out yeah, of the and, attic. And that became, you know, what, what we have today. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah. 
So next up we have The Sea with a Nemo and Friends. Um, this one, I mean, it's, yeah, I don't know. It's not a thrill ride by any stretch of the imagination. It's a story ride. What I like about this one, and, and this one I would give probably probably a seven because it's not just the ride, it's the entire experience. It centers around an aquarium and they use digital projection on the uh, side of the aquarium to kind of tell a story as you're going along and stuff. But you're literally looking out into a massive tank of water with real fish in there and stuff. So it has a really cool effect. But once you come off that ride, there's an entire aquarium there to explore with divers and everything. They've got, they've got one uh, dive simulation where they have the divers actually come into a pressure chamber and they fill it up and you see them go swimming. It's, it's really pretty neat the way that they do it. The whole experience is really very well done. Um, so Michelle, what are your thoughts on it? I would give the whole uh, pavilion probably a, a seven because the individual ride itself is probably kind of like a five. Um, but just the whole immersive aspect of it, of, you know, you going on the ride and projecting, um, you know, videos onto the individual, uh, wildlife, uh, sea life in there, and then being able to actually go and get a deeper look at some of them. Um, and then of course there's turtle talk, you know, uh, dude. <laughs> so that's kind of a, a cute little, uh, side thing, you know, if you want to sit on the floor, cause there's no seats for that. <laughs> Um, but then all the other interactive things. So kind of like a, a day at the aquarium, you know, condensed into, condensed one, little into area. To one little area and it's all air conditioned. So, and that, that <laughs> why it's rate so high with me. Right. Right. Madison. I'd probably give it a six be in between both of you on the ride at least. Um, it's definitely, it's definitely, uh, an interesting ride considering that it is slightly unique while it's certainly just a story ride, it is cool that it's a legitimate aquarium and that the activities afterwards do exist, and I really find it cool. The ride itself, though, is kind of meh, and I don't always, and we don't always go on it, so that's pretty much it. Okay. So that brings us to the World Showcase. Now, I think a lot of people probably don't realize that when you go to the other side of the park where the countries are, some of these countries actually have attractions, mm -hmm. and a lot of people might not realize that there's attractions. Again, they're not huge thrill rides or anything. Uh, some of them happen to be movies. You had a couple with 360-degree uh, theaters in there telling stories and stuff. But the couple that, that really stand out, uh, one is one that we go on all the time in Mexico, and that's the Grand Fiesta Tour starring the Three Caballeros. Tell us about that one, Maddie. It's pretty much a boat ride, and it goes, and you, see, and basically the story of it is just that the three caballeros are going to perform a show for us, but Donald's missing, and then you kind of see it, the story play out through projections on like screens, and I do like how in certain areas, like some of the screens are different, like when Donald's in the water, it's an actual little puddle. At one point, it pulls um, a little, uh, it's a small world moment where you kind of have like little characters and they're playing out a scene in Mexico. Um, for the ride itself, I'll give it a seven. Okay. Um, while it's certainly not, well, it's, well, the story is the same every time. I do kind of like how it's presented. I definitely like the little scene where it is kind of in It's a Small World one, and they ended up changing the ending where it's actual animatronics rather than a projection of the screen, and I really like how they did the animatronics there. Yeah. Um, also, you at the start of it, you kind of get to see this one scene um, that of Mexico where like people can like dine and so forth on the inside, and it's really a nice view there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. All right. I would give it a four myself. Again, not a thrill ride. It's a little story ride. Um, but I like the entire environment. So the, the restaurant that you're referring to is actually inside of a pyramid. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing when you walk inside is you feel like you're in a night scene at a little uh, Mexican village somewhere. Uh, there's shops around. There's little stalls and stuff like that. 
And when you ride the first part of the ride, you're out in the water and there's a volcano on one side and the restaurant's on the other side. So it's kind of a really neat a, a mix of effects that they do there. Uh, but it's, you know, that's a nostalgic one. We always like to go on that one. It's a good family ride. It's, again, air conditioned. Good chance to cool off and relax a little bit by the time we get over to the, to the countries there. Mm -hmm. uh, Michelle? I would probably give it a seven. Um, when Epcot first opened, a lot of the rides and attractions were very um, tourist-driven, like tourism-driven. Like they were basically commercials or advertisements to, hey, come visit our country. And the the original ride didn't have the, the characters in, involved in it. So it was basically the same ride, just without characters. And it was kind of the idea behind it was, look at all these different things you can do in Mexico. We have swimming. We have fine dining. We have this. We you have know, volcanoes. We have volcano. <laughs> you know, come in and visit us. And that was kind of, you know, by the time you got off the ride, it was like, hey, I want to book a trip to Mexico now. And then over the years, so you get off the ride, and you're in a travel agency, not a gift kind shop. Kind of, and that was, and that was, I think, you know, how a lot of guests saw a lot of the different attractions, uh, you know, at the World Showcase area where they were really trying to get tourism, um, and then they added the characters, so then it didn't feel, you know, as much like that so that was a nice little you know twist to get your kids to go on the ride because other than that you know they'd probably be and again you get a very uh it's a small world vibe you know from the one you know scene towards sure. towards the end okay well, that's good uh so the next one that we're going to talk about is one that was actually a revamp of one of the tourist rides and that is frozen ever after and I never went on the original ride. We always sort of skipped the Scandinavian peninsula there. Yeah. Um, but from what you had said, it was very similar. The mechanics were very similar to what the original ride was. Right. The original ride was basically the same, you know, boat ride, um, you know, not to spoil it at one point, you know, your, your boat stops and then, you know, you kind of go backwards and things like that. So all of that mechanic, just spoil it for everyone. Now. Sorry. <laughs> Spoilers. Um, were the same. What was funny was there used to be a movie that you saw at the end. So the idea of the ride was like a little more, um, of the mythology of trolls and things like that, because that's what ends up happening is a troll puts a spell on you and, you know, takes you back. And then, you know, you, when you're back to normal, then you see like the oil rigs and you're like, this is weird. And then when you would get off the ride, there'd be a movie that was about modern day Norway and like, everybody would just exit like nobody would stop <laughs> you know you would just keep walking and, and go to the end so obviously for the frozen <laughs> frozen ride they took out the movie and you know extended the gift shop basically and so now it's all themed you know with with anna and elsa so how would you rate it uh, i would give it a i'd give it an eight you know, unfortunately, it's a it's a long. It's usually always a long wait unless you have a lightning lane uh, or you get there very early or you know very late. I'm kind of surprised they don't have more interactive stuff in the queue. Um, you know, there's stuff to kind of look at, but nothing really interactive. Um, you know, and and that's kind of surprising since they recently you know put that in, and that seems to be a thing that they do with so many of their newer attractions. Madison, how would you rate it? I'd give it an 8.5. While, like you said, in the queue, they don't really have a lot of interactive stuff, they definitely still tried to get the aesthetic of it, and mm -hmm. I can appreciate that. I also like the uh, version of their animatronics. While they certainly look a little weird at times, um, it's definitely an interesting way to do animatronics, where they just light up their face, but you can still move them. Um... I do like the ride mechanics, um, even though that was probably in the original ride, but we never re rode the original ride, so can't really do much for that. Um, but I definitely like that 
it definitely felt like a different ride when we first were on it, um, and it wasn't like your typical dark ride, which was kind, which it's kind of a mix of a dark ride and a boat ride because it's still one of those story progression ones. Um, so yeah, I'd give it an eight point five because I generally kind of like. Okay, <clears throat> I am not a big fan of it myself. I like kind of the the decor that they use. And I will say it was, it was a much more interesting boat ride than the, uh, what was the Avatar oh, one? Oh, the Avatar one. Oh, yeah. In, in Animal Kingdom. So it was certainly better than that. Mm -hmm. um, I'd give it a five just for the, for the you know, overall storytelling of it. Um, I think I've only gone on it once at this point. I've not had a compelling reason to go back to it. Yeah. So the last one that we have, <clears throat> and then we'll take a break. That is of the brand new one that you guys went on, which I didn't get to go on. I could have, but it was too hot and I left after that. Uh, was Remy's Ratatouille Adventure. Maddie, why don't you tell us about that one? So that's definitely an interesting ride. A lot it's one of it's a 3D ride, but it's also a ride that kind of has loose mechanics and like Every time you go on it, you can kind of go in different areas or you move differently than everybody else. Um, basically, most a, lo a lot of it is really just you're seeing movie screens and in the small ride, you're kind of like moving with the movie screens. It's kind of like Soren, but you're not like in a hang glider and you're just in this one little car and you're kind of just moving and so forth. Um, a lot of it's really just in the screen, but there are like different scenes that are there and again it's a 4d ride so you ended up seeing like 3d stuff you're squirted with water at certain points and again you're kind of moving um i definitely like the aesthetic of the queue while there's again not many activities to do in the queue um it's definitely interesting to see the queue at some point there is like a scene where there's like gusto and the sign and like he ends up moving in the queue which i found kind of cool um, for my overall rating on the ride, 6.5. Wow. Mm. Boy, hating on the rat, huh? Wow. I don't know. Like, especially justify trying to justify the wait time. While it is a new ride, the wait time is not justified. It's, I don't know. Like. Well, you don't have to justify. I think you, I think that's a fair rating from what you've described. I don't, I wouldn't question it. Yeah, it's an interesting story. It's not really a story ride because you're. It's like a completely new story, kind of, but it kind of brings back all the characters from it. But I don't know. I guess like I would have preferred a bit more of the animatronic side rather than the four D side. But all right, Michelle, your thoughts? I don't know. I would. I would probably rate it an eight. A uh, little, little bit higher, obviously, um, because it's it's some new ride technology. It's the trackless system, um, you know. So you're in this little mouse, and you know, a couple of you kind of follow each other, and then all of a sudden, you know, two of you go this way, two of you go this way, um, you know, and at some point, you kind of go into like your own little theater where they do the whole, you know, movie aspect, and. Of course, I'm thinking, oh, my God, we're going to drop <laughs> because we have a, you know, we have a, uh, you know, there, there's a, a, a lap bar uh, crap because that, you know, that always means you're going to drop on something. But it, you just kind of have the sensation that you're going to, but you don't. And then, you know, you kind of move along and then, you know, there are, th you know, actual aspects where you know you're the size of a mouse so you know everything's larger than life you know above you and you, you you go to the next room and you know stuff happens and you know another movie happens and then you go to something else and there's another scene and something else and another movie and and you know a lot of back and forth back and forth um so i thought it was it was definitely cute an interesting take on you know uh the whole uh new ride technology I wouldn't wait an hour for it, so thankfully we had a lightning lane and didn't have to, you know, wait as long, so. All right. Well, I think that's a good summary of what we have available at Epcot. We're going to take a quick break, and we're going to come back, and we're going to take a look at Hollywood Studios when we come back. All righty. For over seven years... 
The Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, nice. annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to Insights and the Teens. We are reading rides in Hollywood Studios now. So going up Hollywood Boulevard, um, we did see the distinct absence of many of the what are they, the Hollywood players, they're called? Uh. A lot of the yeah, ambiance. The, the uh, street atmosphere. Yeah, a lot of the ambiance was missing uh, during our trip, which was kind of disappointing. Uh, but uh, we did get to go on the new ride, which replaced the great movie ride on Hollywood Boulevard, and that is Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. That's a mouth mouthful there, isn't it? <laughs> yep. Uh, Michelle, why don't you start off with uh, your your review? I would give this one I uh, like a nine or a ten. Uh, yeah, nine point five. Yeah, yeah, I know okay. you would. Okay. Okay. That's it. Well, it's Mickey's first ride. This is the first ride that Mickey ever w was on. This yep. After 90 something years, he finally got a ride. <laughs> I like yes, I I miss the great movie ride. The the great movie ride helped to uh, you know, set the stage for your day, you know, in the park. And, you know, give you some history on, on some old movies. And, and so it's, it's kind of sad that they got rid of it to create this ride. But I like how they were able to take the whole trackless um, ride technology and kind of enhance it a little bit. And the, uh, the interactiveness of the screen and you know you're watching a movie and all of a sudden you have to go through it and you know you know the the trains kind of break apart but come back together and you know a couple of different scenes and again there are, are scenes that we didn't see that they have so it's not always the same ride you know when you go on it so i, I thought it was cute i liked it all right maddie um I think I'll give it an 8. While it definitely reminded me a lot of Remy's ride, I found myself enjoying it a lot more. Um, probably one of, my, one of the best uh, tone setters I've seen. Basically, you're put into this area. You're just in the Chinese theater for a bit, and then you're watching a screen, and then it crashes, and a legitimate hole appears that I was not expecting to see. And as soon as you go through that hole, you immediately see that you're in this cartoony world because it's in the new art style that I know you don't like. Um, but, like, you're immediately basically transported into an area that looks way more cartoony than anything else in the ride's queue, which I really found enjoyable. And because we ended up being in the caboose, I really liked how they actually had, like, a specific sound for the caboose. Because it's like, you guys are all the way in the back. I know that the train it's, itself is supposed to open and see, like, Goofy. And then he's, and for the back, since you can't really see it, it's like, he, like, is still speaking with you. And I really liked that. Um, again, I really liked that it was certainly different. And... There were definitely going to be different scenes that you could have gotten depending on where you were on the ride. Um, I actually also do like that not only is it 
like one of those similar cinema screens like with Remy and then it's another one of the trackless systems. But there are legitimate kind of animatronics and they're done interestingly enough to where it's like it kind of still matches with the original art style, which I kind of like. Okay. And what was your rating? Uh, an eight. An eight. I'm not even going to rate this because um, we have a point scale of one to ten. Um, I, 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 did, I didn't like the ride. It was jerky unnecessarily. Uh, they did away with the great movie ride, which how do you do away with a ride that's called great? I don't know. In a park that's a Hollywood park and you do away with literally the only ride that has anything to do with Hollywood, you've done away with it. Uh, you've done it in a style that I absolutely can't stand because it's literally like Disney reinventing the worst type of art style you could possibly do. Um, so that's how you really feel. And, well, and like, you know, Disney is known for, for quality animation and the new animation style they have is terrible. It's like, you know... Flip book three three frames per second terrible animation that they do, and they did a whole ride in that theme, and it just completely turned me off. So I, I'm not even going to rate this because it wouldn't even make my scale on a one to ten scale, to be honest with you. Anyway, deep calming breaths. <laughs> Moving on to Echo Lake, which I didn't even know was an area there. <laughs> Uh, we talk about Star Tours. Now, Star Tours, I didn't go on this time because my back was killing me. Star Tours, I will rate, and I will give Star Tours an 8. Uh, I've always liked Star Tours from when we first started going. Unfortunately, because of my bad back, the ride, it's a motion simulator ride. It's themed great walking through the entire queue and everything. You, you can't beat the giant AT-AT out front there, especially yeah. when it shoots water in the in the heat. Um, but the ride's just a little too jerky for me right now. The last time I went on there, I wound up wrenching my back and, and it was not happy. Um, but I love the ride, especially when I get on the ride and it's the Vader scene because the way they put the ride together, there's three sections or three scenes and those scenes are randomly, uh, generated now. Well, not randomly, but they're randomly selected. They're the same scenes over and over, but each of those scenes has a different, selection of scenes you can get um and it's nice the one time you were the the rebel spy on the on the ride which was always kind of fun when that happens uh, and it opens into one of the best gift shops in disney world so i i, I really like the ride michelle your thoughts i would probably give it a an eight as well um you know i like how over the years they've enhanced it and did new scenes for uh you know to to kind of change it up and i like how it's it's very random so that you don't always get the same scene um it is a little jerky but it's uh, the good thing about it is it's not as motion sensitive as um body wars was which was the same ride technology that they had at Epcot years ago. And the idea was that you were going through the human body and that I would actually get sick on. Uh, I'd actually have to close my eyes um, because the, the movement didn't always seem to match the, the movie. Uh, and also the, the movie was, a, you know, obviously different. Um, and people always said, oh, I don't get sick on Star Tours, but I get sick on, on Body Wars. Um, so that's always nice. Um, I wish they would have kind of incorporated it a little bit more with Galaxy's Edge yeah. because it is kind of a separate entity from it. So it does seem kind of out of place and weird. Well, and it's almost like they could have redesigned the area itself like they did with... Uh, Toy Story Mania. Toy Story Mania, Mania mm -hmm. where exactly. your entrance now comes in from Toy Story Land. Right. Right. So they should have done that with Star Tours. Right. And I don't know if it was And all just... you had to do was, you know, get up and get the ad at the walk to the other side. That's okay. all you had to do. So, so yeah, overall, a good ride. All right. Madison? I'll give it an eight as well to round out the trio. All um right. Crazy eights. And before Star... And, of course, before Star Wars Land, that was the real... The, like, big-themed Star Wars ride. And... The theming is probably one of the best I've seen. Yeah. It 
park. The ad out outside's really cool. It's one uh, you get to the inside and like it's the it's the very Star Wars esque area where you're actually getting checked and everything. I do like the story that like there's a little movie that plays while you're waiting. And, like, I do like the story to it, but, again, it's really cool that, like, it's always different. There's always a different combination, and you never know what you're going to get. Like um, a box of chocolates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the whole uh, thing with the whole Rebel Spy uh, is pretty fun, and I do enjoy that. Um, I like that they have C-3PO that is not just in the 3D, that is actually in there with us. Yeah. I do like that detail. Um and it also matches very well, the motion matches very well with the screen, and obviously when you exit, you get to the gift shop, which is really cool, so yeah. I give it an 8. Okay. And the other thing, too, is that the idea behind it, and maybe this is why they don't have it in Galaxy's Edge, is because... It's also, you know, the idea behind it was it's in Hollywood Studios and it's like the behind the scenes. So at one point when you're walking, you see the ad at, but when you get to a certain point in the queue, you look and you see it's really a facade of, a, of, of an, an ad, ad, ad. ad. <laughs> right? Because you have the the back lot, uh, you know, commissary right there too. So it's kind of the idea is to give you the feel that you're on a movie set. Right. Whereas when you go to Galaxy's Edge, you are on a planet in the Star Wars galaxy. So, Well, uh, sticking with the Star Wars theme, we move on to Galaxy's Edge, my favorite place to be in all of Disney World at this point in time, despite the fact that Darth Vader's not there. Um, this is a, like just this whole area. I could just go there and just, just hang out and not even ride anything all day long. Uh, but the first ride we're going to talk about is the uh, one that we went on for the first time uh, this last time down, and that is Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run. What are your thoughts, Maddie? It's definitely a very unique ride in the fact that you actually are controlling it. And it's a lot more controlling than how when we talked about last week about uh, Tomorrowland Speedway, where you're controlling the car. This time, you're actually given a job, and you have to push buttons or move triggers in order to steal whatever it is you're supposed to steal for the resistance in order to get money. You're given either the job of an engineer, a f uh, a, fl a flyer, or a your pilot. A, we call a pilot. Yeah. Or flyers or a hockey team, or an attacker, or at least w that's a gunner. gunner. A gunner. It's Clearly, sorry. you didn't listen to the briefing. <laughs> I'm sorry, because she was an engineer every time. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and basically, you get different jobs each time. The engineers have to push buttons in order to fix any like damages that the that uh, the ship gets inflicted with uh, when you know the uh, pilots end up crashing into stuff you're either a button masher or a stick mover that's really what you are um but like it definitely tries to include everyone the engineers also like shoot out uh the the, the grappling grappling hooks. hooks in order to grab the stuff you need the gunners are obviously the ones that shoot at stuff and you just hit the buttons there and you're also supposed to shoot out missiles as well and then obviously the pilots are the ones that control it. But one goes up and down, the other goes left and right. So it's a little confusing there. Um, but there's six people on each one. But I know that they have more people at once because I s ended up seeing one of the behind the scenes one where they end up turning all of them and they have a bunch of capsules. The aesthetic of the ride is really cool and unique. I really like that. You actually get to be on the Millennium Falcon and seeing it like that in you know real life is really cool. So I should probably rate it. Uh, I'll g I'll give it a 9 out of 10. All right. Michelle? I would also give it a 9 out of 10. Uh, again, the the aesthetics of everything, the theming behind it is, is just really cool. You know, just the, the aspect when you get to Galaxy's Edge and you walk and you see the Millennium Falcon there. You know, so anybody that's ever been a fan of Star Wars or watched Star Wars grew up with it, you know, to see it, you're like, oh my God, it really does exist. You know, that that was really kind of it. And to, to get on the ride and, you know, you're walking and, and the, the theming behind it. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, there's the chess set. 
that's awesome. I want to stop and play, you know? And it's like, no, you got to keep moving. You're like, uh, you know? Um, so of course, both times we, we got the same job, um, which was a little disappointing. Uh, but, you know, like when you're the engineer, all you're doing is pushing buttons. But for the most part, you can still watch, you know, what you're doing. You're in the cockpit of, uh, you know, the, the Falcon. So they can't really fit more than six people, which is nice that they're not, you know. So as long as you kind of keep an eye that your buttons aren't lighting up, you can watch, you know, most of it. So I don't know how the rest of it goes. Obviously, if you get somebody that can't fly, you're ride might be over a little bit, you know, a uh, shorter time period than somebody else that, that does a little better. So I like that, that it's, it is kind of interactive, uh, you know, with that. And it just looks really cool. I like the engineering of the ride because the way that they do it is, you know, when you walk up to the ride, you see the facade that is the full-size Millennium Falcon, and you never step on that. You go into the ride behind it, and the ride behind it operates very much like the barrel of a six-shooter. You know, you have multiple cockpits, and they rotate the cockpits in from loading to unloading as you're doing the job. Yeah. So it's really neat the way they do that. It's also really cool that you're literally inside of a giant video game because it's run off of Unreal Engine, which powers all the modern video games of today. It's the same engine that... Your shooters work off of, your uh, Star Wars Squadron works off of. All the video games that you play on your console or computer power this technology, which is what's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, if you get a bad pilot and you're the engineer, you wind up spending a lot more time button mashing than you do looking at the screen, unfortunately. Um, but obviously, you know, no matter what, six people in there... You know, it'll, it'll fit six people in the seats or probably two Wookiees. <laughs> it's just cool. The ambiance, you know, you literally, they maintain the aspect of that total immersion. You know, when you walk through the queue, you're walking on the Millennium Falcon and you feel it. And when you step into that cockpit and you sit down and fasten your seatbelt, you're on the Millennium Falcon. Um, it's just awesome. You know, like I compare it to Star Tours. So when you get on Star Tours, the screen is up in Star Tours. So you don't, don't really see anything until the ride starts. But when you walk into this, the screen is on. You see a hangar bay that you're in and, and people walking in it and all that stuff. So I, I don't know. It's just it was one of those rides that's very immersive. I'd give it a, an eight. I wouldn't I don't want to give it a nine because the seats were really uncomfortable and you did get bounced around a lot, but I had to find something to complain about. Sure. Speaking of complaints, let's talk about Star Wars Rise of the Resistance yet. Michelle, why don't you tell us about your unique experience <laughs> with this ride? Well, again, this was one that I didn't do any research on beforehand. And I was like, Oh, it'll be fine. I, I saw enough videos of it and it's, it's, there's, there's nothing that's going to drop. It's fine. It's, it's all good. Right. Yeah. Not so much. Um, but I would still give it a 10 even, you know, it scared the living bejesus out of me. Um, I think the whole, you know, uh, obviously we, unfortunately we didn't get to do it this last time that we were here, uh, down there. So we did it the, the time before when they still had the virtual queue, which worked out, you know, fantastic with that. Um, and it was just very immersive because it kind of the same, uh, idea with the cast members uh, on the Haunted Mansion being kind of, you know, very stoic and, you know, here they're the same way because they are part of the Empire and, you know, they're they're mean. <laughs> and they'll pick on you and, you know, get in line and do this and do that. And, um, you know, and, and the pre-show was very immersive and, you know, just the whole it it. it kind of reminded me in some respect when we had done the Star Trek experience where, you know, you're in one thing and all of a sudden you're not in something else. And it was kind of that same thing. You know, it was like you're on the ship and then all of a sudden you come out of the ship and there's all these stormtroopers and where did they all come from? And how many of them 
are real because they seem really real and it's like move along and then you're going to this and you're like what now we're and you're not even on the ride yet and you've been immersed in all of this stuff you know beforehand and then the ride comes and you're like oh my god where are we going and you know and then you go in the big giant ad at you're like that's a real ad at oh my god you know and then the guns and kylo ren and and everything going on and then the end and oh my god and you know and then it ends and you're like okay that was cool <laughs> okay Good summer. thank you madison i would also give it a 10 it's probably one of the be- coolest rides i've ever been on it uh basically you get the pre-show, which, you know, already gets you immersed, and then you're on this one little ship, and, like, you're, like, kind of, it's, again, one of the 3D ones where you're kind of trying to escape the Empire, but you don't actually escape the Empire. When you think, like, you're almost there, you get captured, and you assume that was the ride, but then you realize that you're in a completely different area than when you first entered. You see all these stormtroopers, you're like... How many of those are real? And then you just get all the cast members moving you along. And they are mean. They're legitimately acting. And it's like, you know, that'd be a really cool job to actually have if, like, you were a cast member. And then you're put into different sections. And then at some point a door opens. And then, like, you're given another show. You get, like, Kylo Ren. And then, like, you're getting busted out Kylo by Troy. You get another show. Kylo Ren gets out and does a song and dance do, for do, you. Do, 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 do. <laughs> And then, like, you're being busted out by, like, this one, like... You resistance scum. There's, like, a droid in the front, and there's, like, this little card, and, like, the droid's been override, and then then you get into the actual ride, and you're... You see you're tired the anim- by the time you get to the ride. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you see, like, really cool animatronic effects. The way they did the guns was amazing. You see the giant ad ad. Then you think you're going to go down on an elevator, but then you go up, and then you just, like, and then it continues to go on. And then, obviously, when you're getting ready to escape, the drop. <laughs> and the, oh, my God. <laughs> and then... And then With other th- words added to it. Yes. yes. But this uh, is a family show. Right. And then you're exiting, and then it's like, wow, that happened. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, th- I would be tempted to give this a 10, but I can't give anything a 10, so I'll give it a 9.9. Um, the technology that they demonstrate here is incredible. The first scene that you walk into, yeah, you get BB-8 and all that stuff, but you step onto a ship that is outside, and you ride this ship. There's a movie in the front, in the cockpit. There's a movie behind you. You can follow it, and what happens, this ship gets captured onto a Star Destroyer. The door that you just walked into that was outside opens. There was no sensation of changing floors that you were in an elevator or anything. It opens into the hangar bay of a Star Destroyer where all the stormtroopers are lined up and a massive hangar bay door with ships flying by does not look like a screen. It looks like you're in space. And the rest of the thing continues on foot until at some point in time you do transition into an off-the-rails type of car ride that you do. And then the battle breaks out and you have blaster fire. And you can see the blaster fire. You can see explosions as it hits the wall. Then you go up the elevator and the adats are shooting at you. And you see the blast go over your head and hit the wall. The technology to do that, to provide that illusion, that, that level of realism, the audio animatronic of Kylo Ren is incredible. You wind up in a lift at one point in time with him chasing you and his lightsaber blasts through the ceiling of the chamber and starts to cut it open. It was just the most incredible thing I had ever seen. It was like you were in the middle of a video game, but everything was real. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I don't know how he pulled off some of those effects. I would love to see it behind the scenes to see how that technology actually works. Because that was just insane. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would give this a 9.9 on a scale of 1 to 10. 
Uh, we're, we're coming up on the clock here. We're not going to get to our second segment, so I think we're going to turn that into another uh, another podcast because we have a lot to talk about. But I do want to finish up with story uh, Toy Story Land. I think there's some very good rides there, none of which I've been on, so I can't talk. So it should go a lot faster now. Maddie, tell us about Toy Story Mania, which I have been on. Yeah, you just lied. Anyway, uh, Toy Story Mania is definitely an interesting ride. It's another 3D ride, but the whole concept is that, like, Andy has this shooter carnival game thing in his, in, like, his toy box. And the whole idea is that you're a toy and you're going through them, and it's basically one of the things where you shoot at various targets to gain points. And with a second person with you, like, you guys actually get to keep score of, like, how many points you end up getting, and there's various different scenes. You actually move around, and it's really fun. Uh, the theming's really cool, and basically you keep score of it. How would you rate it? Uh, I'd give it an 8 out of 5. An 8 out of 10. An 8 out of 5, huh? No, okay. eight out of, sorry, I was thinking 8 to points. 5. I was thinking 8 to 5 is because I'm watching bed. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Michelle, what are your thoughts? I would give it a, an 8 as well. It's a interesting interactive. It's very reminiscent of the Buzz Lightyear, um, but much more fast-moving. Uh, you don't have any control over where you're shooting. It, it moves you into where you are. But the theming of the ride, you know, makes you feel like you're a toy because everything is larger, you know, than life. So that's that's a very cool aspect of it. And I'd give it an eight myself. You know, the only thing is if you're mo if you're susceptible to motion mm -hmm. sickness, it's rough because you're spinning around, you're going backwards, you're going sideways. So it takes a little bit of a uh, little bit of poise to get through that. And you need to learn to pull that string really fast to shoot as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, don't go for the cheap points. Go for the high points. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the next two I've not been on, the first being Slinky Dog Dash, which only you have been on. Tell us about only you can prevent fires from <laughs> Um. So the whole point is that Slinky's been turned into a roller coaster um, in the outside of Andy's area. Um, and you basically just ride Slinky. And it certainly is a very fun ride. There is theming, and most of it is outside. Um... But, like, you get various sound effects on it, you see various characters, there's certain drops in areas, and then there's one point where you kind of stop, and then you go backwards, and there's rings, and then you just shoot off again. Um, it's definitely one of the more exhilarating roller coasters I've been on, um, and I've been on it multiple times, and it's certainly very fun, so I'll give it a 9 out of 10. All right. And then the last one that we had was the Alien Swirling Saucers which both of you have been on, but I have not. Now, this is a different, like, no pun intended, but different twist to the teacups. Tell us about it. Right. So it's, um, I don't know, three or four aliens on an arm, and then there's, like, four aliens on it. So you kind of spin. Kind of reminds me of, like, the whipper rides, where you kind of go around, and then it kind of flings you out, and you fling around. So... Um, you know, so there's a lot of movement. So it, it's kind of, you know, the teacup, uh, you know, variation, except you're not, you know, spinning and you don't have any control of how fast or how slow you go. Um, so if you're motion sensitive or you have a bad back, it's not something you'd want to go on. And unfortunately, it's one of those, it's over before it kind of starts ride. So you're only on it for like a minute and a half. So we usually only go on it when there's little to no weight or we got a lightning lane and could basically walk on it. Um, so I'd probably give it a, a six. Okay. Madison? I'm actually going to give it a seven, mainly because, like, there are definitely certain parts we end up twisting and it's, like, really fun. Um, it is pretty much like the swirling, like, the teacups, but, like, you end up in certain areas getting changed because, like, there's, like, two circles and, like, you go from one circle to the next. And they do actually have two areas so they can ba manage the workflow a bit more, kind of like the Dumbo mm -hmm. one. Okay. Yeah. So I appreciate that. There's not a lot of theming to it, but I still like the ride itself. All right. Well, the last section we have is Sunset Boulevard, which has another ride none of us have been on, so I'm not sure how it made this list. Mm -hmm. And then the last ride 
is Rock and Roller Coaster, which only you have been on. Why don't you tell us about that one? So I only have been on it once, um, but basically it's the only ride in Disney that has loop-de-loops and makes you go upside down. Uh, there's a little pre-show where you're kind of talking to Aerosmith and they're giving you like a ticket to go to their concert and the whole story is just like you're supposed to get there as fast as you can, which, clumsy story, but oh well. Um, it, but the queue <laughs> Everybody's for the, a critic. The queue for the most part before you get through the pre-show isn't all that much, but when you get into the pre-show you actually see the ride, the lighting's really cool and like there's different shadows. And pretty much the ride... You basically, like, get strapped in, and you're, like, at the start, you're launched, pretty much, and you get that really fast and safe. So this one uses the linear acceleration motors, the maglev, where it accelerates you. It's not a pull-type thing. Yeah, and you're also listening to an Aerosmith song when you are on the ride. And it's also kind of a... There's, like, the roller coaster itself, the track at least, is kind of, like, in neo-colors. I didn't really see a lot of it, but I know that, like, the track was, like, green... And, like, black light and so forth. And, like, there were various signs and stuff. I got uh, jiggly. My legs felt like jelly afterwards. It's definitely the most intense roller coaster I've been on. But for what it is, I'll give it an 8.5. Um, the theming could probably have been better. Like, I don't know if Aerosmith specifically would have been the best. Well, they're a little out of touch these days, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah maybe, like, changing that would be a little better. But, like, I can still appreciate it being the only roller coaster in Disney to go upside down. Okay. Well, I think that was a good rundown of some of the more popular ones that we can talk about, at least. Uh, and I think that's all we're going to have time for today. Uh, before we do go, I want to once again invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can find audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights in the, th in the Teens. And you can find audio and uh, video versions of all the network's podcasts listed as Insights into Things. We're available on Pandora, Castro, Stitcher, Podbean, anywhere you can get a podcast. I would also invite you to write in, give us your feedback, give us your suggestions for things you'd like us to talk about. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We do stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. We are available on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast, or you can get links to all those and more on our official website at insights into things dot com and you and don't forget to check out our other two podcasts insights and entertainment normally hosted by you and mommy and it's next to tomorrow not no not really our monthly podcast anymore hosted by you and my brother sam most of the time all right that's it another one in the books bye everyone bye, bye.